Kuzampo and welcome to another segment of Bhutan This Week. I'm Keza Wangmo. Our top stories this week. His Majesty the King graces graduation ceremony of first cohort of graduates of JSW Law. Her Majesty Queen Mother Sangye Chodan Wan Chu launched gender assessment in hydropower, road and bridge construction sites in Bhutan's report. In Bhutan, Dendral Sokwa applies for party registration. The first cohort of students at the Jimmy Singe Wanchu School of Law has completed their studies. His Majesty the King graced the graduation ceremony for the graduates from the Jimmy Singe Wanchu School of Law at Pambisa in Paro on 25th November. The cohort of 25 graduates of the class of 2022, who were the first students to be admitted to JSW Law when it opened its doors in 2015, received the BA, LLB and PGDNL degree. In an address to the graduates, His Majesty said that they must continue to pursue higher learning and specialization to be able to succeed globally and contribute towards the progress Bhutan aspires to achieve. The JSW law was established by Royal Charter on 21st February 2015. Her Royal Highness Princess Sunam Dachinwangchuk, President of the JSW Law, the Prime Minister and members of the Governing Council attended the ceremony together with the faculty and families of the graduates. Tashi Norbu was awarded the Institute's Mirror of Wisdom Award for all-around excellence during his time at JSW Law. News. His Majesty the Fort Rook Gelpo, their Majesties the Queen Mothers, their Royal Highnesses, the Princess and Princesses graced the consecration ceremony of the newly constructed Mitublaka in Punaka, 1st December. His Holiness the Jekhempo presided over the consecration ceremony of the Mitublaka. Prime Minister Dr. Lotus Ring, the Chairperson of the National Council, the Chief Justice and the other senior government officials also attended the ceremony. One storied traditional structure, Mitublaka, is located at Kurutang. It was constructed under the sponsorship of Yum Tlechodin. The temple has the relics of Gelwa Mituk. It took almost two years to complete the construction of the Laka. Henceforth, the temple will function as one of the community service centers to conduct funeral rites and rituals. For Changadoji, Sunampem for BBS News. His Holiness the Jay Kimpo has consecrated the Sange Minjur Haka in Funsuling. As part of the event, a Jutsen Milarepa Thondrel was also unfurled. Hundreds of devotees attended the event and received blessings. The magnificent structure atop the hill of Wandi Gatsil is a replica of the Serka Guthok Haka in Tibet, built by the enlightened Tibetan scholar Jutsen Milarepa. Construction of the monastery began in 2013. Women working in construction sector are experiencing workplace incivility, bullying and sexual harassment. But not all the cases are being reported to the authorities. This according to the gender assessment in hydropower, road and bridge construction sites in Bhutan's report is due to fear of losing jobs. Her Majesty the Queen Mother, Sangye Chodan Wanchu, launched the report on 25th November coinciding with the International Day for Elimination of Violence Against Women. In hydropower sector, the prevalence of sexual harassment was about 10%. As per the report, 81 respondents, including 46 men in the sector, experienced workplace sexual harassment in the last three years. Of it, only two women and three men took up the matter with the authorities. Around 90% of the respondents didn't file a complaint. Similarly, in the road construction sector, of the eight individuals who experienced sexual harassment, none reported the matter to the authorities. We would like to really advocate and people know that there is a privilege and we need to have intervention put in place. Therefore, um, uh, with this study, it gives us an avenue really to 
uh, advocate to the people uh, for the upcoming construction sites that this kind of things needs to be addressed. So this is the purpose of this study uh, because we really like to have the interventions made uh, with the evidence base. According to the report, most didn't file a complaint because of indifferent responses from their supervisors and some considered the matter not grievous enough. Moreover, the report highlighted about the noticeable breach of Labor Employment Act and occupational health and safety regulation concerning working hours and lifting heavy loads. The report recommends awareness programs, implementing rules effectively and timely interventions among others. And I believe that the program outlined going forward, it's not just about women and girls, but we're also looking to work with boys and men to try to have behavioral change so that we can prevent gender-based violence from happening. I think that um, going forward, again, there's a whole of community approach to, to stopping gender-based violence. At the event, Her Majesty the Queen Mother also launched an initiative to empower the Lunap community. The initiative includes creating awareness for the Highlanders who will be in Punaka during winter. The Lunaps will receive health, education and social well-being packages through this initiative. The country celebrated this year's International Day for Elimination of Violence Against Women, focusing on importance of partnering with men and boys and the economic empowerment of women and girls to end violence against women. For Devika Pradhan, Sringzam, BBS News. Her Majesty the Queen Mother Sangya Churanwanchu has graced the launch of a series of national survey reports on Bhutanese textiles. The survey reports by the Royal Textile Academy include Bhutan Handwoven Textile Industry Survey, National Textiles Purchase and Consumption Survey and Youth Attitudinal Survey on Weaving, Designing and Textile Culture in Bhutan. These reports are expected to provide a thorough understanding of the textile sector and will guide in the formulation of policies and programs which will further develop the textile and design industry. Her Majesty also launched a design resource center at RTA and a theory of color booklet. Bhutan has achieved another historical and significant technological milestone with the successful launch of the second satellite. The nano satellite launched on 26th November named the India Bhutan Sat has a vast capacity for application which will benefit various sectors in the country. The Prime Minister Dr. Lotus Ring presented the message from His Majesty the King thanking the Indian government, the Indian Space Research Organization and the team for the successful launch of the satellite. Bhutan made its first entry into space with the launch of the Bhutan One CubeSat, an educational satellite weighing about a kilogram more than four years ago. It was more of a capacity development project for the Bhutanese space engineers. But more than this, it provided the confidence to start a bigger endeavor for Bhutan. The satellite launched today weighs about 18 kilograms and has two major functions. The primary capability is to acquire satellite images using a high-resolution camera and the second is to transmit radio signals from space. We have a, a camera payload on, the, on this present satellite and this is going to give us uh, images of the Earth at 29 meters resolution. Uh, earlier we didn't have uh, these features on the satellite. This one we are going to use it for real-life applications in various sectors uh, such as the uh, Department of Forest and Park Services, Department of Human Settlement, Department of Geology and Mines and Department of Energy. India Bhutan Sat is a joint satellite project between the Royal Government of Bhutan and the Government of India. The plan was initiated by India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi following his visit to the country in 2019. It was launched by the Indian Space Research Organization along with India's Earth Observation Satellite 03, also known as OceanSat-3, and seven other nanosatellites. Bhutanese journalists who are currently in India through the Indian Embassy also witnessed the historic launch. Kizan for BBS News.
The Australian government has been inundated with visa applications from international students around the world since its border reopening in February this year. For international students from South Asia region, including Bhutan, the Australian High Commission in New Delhi is escalating their efforts in clearing visa backlog. However, they are advising students to lodge visa application at least eight weeks before the commencement of their courses to avoid delays. This applies to students intending to pursue undergraduate and master's programs in Australian universities. Understanding the distress caused by visa delays among the Bhutanese and other international students from South Asian countries, the Australian High Commission says visa application process is being streamlined. I can understand the worry and the anxiousness with which students and parents alike uh, contemplate um, news or rumours of visa delays or rejections. Uh, what we're trying to do is streamline processes and we have brought on many more staff in New Delhi to process the visa applications of South Asia, of which the Bhutanese um, caseload remains a very important part. Um, at the moment, we are recommending that students do lodge their visas around eight weeks before the commencement of their studies. Between February and June this year, Australia approved a record close to 3 million global visas. As Australia continues to invest in human capital of Bhutan, it is welcoming 30 Bhutanese professionals through its scholarship program to study in the world-class institutions next year. This year, um, like with many economies around the world, the Australian government, despite, despite sorry, its long-standing commitment to development assistance, has had a slight reduction in its global program. That said, we are still sending 10 scholars in the year ahead, and we're even looking to condense that with looking at 2021 and 22 intakes all at once. So in 2023, we'll be sending over 30 Bhutanese scholars to Australia. According to the latest official records, there are more than 13,000 Bhutanese studying and working in Australia. Majority of them have been there through private funding. Pamela Hardin, BBS News. Works to develop the Bhutanese Sign Language is expected to gain pace. The Wangsil Institute for the Deaf in Paro, where the research works are carried out, has recently finished constructing a new research and academic block. The institute is hopeful the adequate space will help them come up with better and faster results. The new structure was constructed with support from Pro Bhutan, a non-governmental organization from Germany. The two-storied building has a total of eight rooms, of which three will be used for research works, specifically for visual and audio recording and research documentation. According to the principal, the new space has come at the right time when works have gained momentum and requires more space. The research room that we had is congested and we couldn't function properly. We were not able to come out with expected results on time. With this, we are optimistic that we can do extensive research and benefit every deaf people in the country. He added that the institute is aiming to develop a comprehensive and uniform sign language in the country. It's not just in our school. There are other schools for deaf, such as in Thimpu and Tashigang. We provide support to them in terms of materials to learn Bhutanese sign language. This is mainly to make the sign language in the country uniform. Meanwhile, with five rooms in the new block to be used as classrooms, it will also help ease the classroom crunch the institute is currently facing. The classrooms are shared between students of two different grades. One group faces one side and the other group the other way. That's how we have been adjusting so far. The Wangsil Institute has been carrying out extensive research work to develop a Bhutanese sign language since 2019. The first edition of the Bhutanese Sign Language was published earlier this year and works are ongoing on the second edition. The institute was established in 2003 as a unit under the Drugel Lower Secondary School and was called the Deaf Education Unit. Today, the Wangsil Institute for the Deaf has about 45 teachers and 112 students. For Namgewanchu in Paro, Hishigelson, BBS News.
The latest political party to join the race, the Bhutan Dendral Tokpa, has submitted its application for registration to the ECB. According to a party spokesperson, the party submitted its application along with the party name, logo, charter and other details to the Election Commission this morning. As per a news release, the party held its first convention recently. During the convention, Dasha Pematel was unanimously elected as the party president. The party is planning to hold a mega convention in Thimpu once it receives approval on its application from the ECB. Around 75% of the candidates representing female have been confirmed and rest of the 25% uh, of the candidates were yet to negotiate with the candidates and for that we have even sent it to the constituents to see their popularity. With the relaxation of COVID restrictions and reopening of tourism, farmhouses in Mera Gyok of Toshigang have been receiving domestic and international visitors. According to records with the Department of Forest and Park Services, about 130 guests visited the farmhouses so far since the border reopening. The distinct culture, pristine environment and snow-clothed mountains are the unique selling points of Mera Gyok, making it a preferred tourist destination. Furthermore, its landscape is like that of Switzerland in Europe, attracting a good number of tourists in the pre-pandemic days. This has led to the Merak bus opening farmhouses to generate income. After a hiatus of almost three years, the farmhouse business is gaining base. Merak Gyok is a remote place and has a unique culture which attracts tourists. So we thought to reopen our farm business and earn good income. I have been operating a farmhouse for about seven to eight years. Before COVID, I received many local visitors, but during the pandemic, I didn't receive any guests at all. Now I'm hoping it will get better. Since reopening of tourism in September this year, about 30 international tourists visited the farmhouses here. They also received about 100 domestic tourists since the relaxations in April this year. According to the farmhouse operators, they charge 1,000 newton per night for the domestic visitors. This covers three meals. For international guests, they charge 2,000 newton per night, also covering three meals. However, they say a committee needs to be constituted to provide better services and ensure equal allocation of guests and for uniformity in rates. I didn't get a single guest this year, though many people visited our place. I think we need a farmhouse committee here as the rate of the farmhouses fluctuates. I don't think we can improve our services by simply increasing the rate. On this, the Georg office said they are ready to help them form a committee. Before the pandemic, each farmhouse operator earned between 30,000 to 100,000 newton. With more people keen to open farmhouses and visitors poised to increase in coming years, it is likely that the farmhouse business will have a large hand in promoting community-based tourism in Merak. For Sonam Darji in Tashigang, this is Pemal Hardin, BBS News. To provide children from remote schools with a fun learning experience and exposure to football, the Bhutan Football Federation initiated the first ever Bridge the Gap program in the capital. 52 students aged 7 to 11 are participating in the program. The five-day program ended recently. From football coaching to playing tournaments, the Federation had arranged all kinds of programs to engage these participants. Students of Getana Primary School in Chuka, Nimtola Primary School in Tagana, Lingji Lower Secondary School, Barishong Primary School, and Sui Extended Classroom in Thimpu participated in the program. I learned how to play football. I'm more confident after meeting new friends here. I'm happy because I get to play with new friends and meet renowned people. 
I am happy about this opportunity. The students are getting a lot of exposure. They understand that there is a world beyond the mountains where they live. We don't have different grounds for football or basketball where they can play. Unlike here, we only have deflated balls to play with. Reaching here and communicating with other students certainly will add to their experience. Through a program such as this, the Federation wants to utilize its role and change the lives of those living in remote areas through football. We also want to instill in the children uh, that football has a future. You know, if you are dedicated and uh, you concentrate on the skills, that football has a future, not only as a player, but as a coach, as a referee, as technical directors, as physiotherapists, as management, there's so many uh, fields that you, you can be involved in football. The Federation plans to make the program an annual event to further reach out to the nooks and corners of the country. For Chengadawa, Kilitim, PBS News. And this is all we have for you this week. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.